when we think of the <clears throat> Easter story, we usually focus on the tomb. Luke has no tomb sightings. This is the first resurrection appearance in Luke. And it's one of the most interesting episodes of Christ's resurrection appearance, I believe, in all of the Gospels. We allude to it every time we take communion, usually in the invitation. And strangely enough, this resurrection narrative seems to hinge upon not some glorious sighting or running and telling, but upon these deflated disciples journeying to Emmaus. Why? Because they'd given up hope and lost belief. Right off the bat, we ask, did we miss something here? Because I've not heard the name Cleopas before. Now, if you're reading real quickly, you may just assume that maybe you read it early on and you forgot it. No, that's not the case. This is the first mention of the name Cleopas. Who is this guy? Why mention this fella at all? I'll skip the history lesson this week, but suffice it to say that church tradition and scholarship vary greatly. Ultimately, though, the Gospel of Luke, I believe, is killing a bunch of birds with a very agile stone. So in 1 Corinthians 15, we hear Paul say that Christ appeared first to Cephas. And again, we know that Cephas is not uh, Cephas or Peter like we usually think because Peter is included in the 12. We talked about that on Easter. And is Cephas, though, this Cleopas? Do we have just an alternate form of the name? Maybe. Some people think so. And if this is the case, then Luke is reconciling the gospel account of the resurrection to match that of Paul's that we see in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul said that Jesus appeared first to Cephas and then to the twelve. If you make Cephas Cleopas in Luke's gospel, now we have a match. Again, there's no time and you'd be bored to tears if I did it anyways, but I'm going to skip over all the historical stuff, even though there are tons of of historical questions that are swirling at this juncture of the gospel. It's interesting to see the way that the gospel writers and early Christian writers wrestled with this name, Cleopas. Uh, was it Cephas? Was it Cleopas? Was it the Clopas that's mentioned in John, the husband of Mary? And was, was he a kinsman redeemer? I mean, it goes on and on and on. And was Simon really Jesus's brother or was it Jesus' cousin who's a this, this Simon is a son of this Clopas. Uh, and oh, by the way, didn't the gospel say that Jesus has brothers? It's Jude and James and Joseph and Simon, right? So there's all of this stuff swirling around. My own hunch is this, is that all of this had to do with the common knowledge that A, James definitely took over the movement at the death of Jesus. And it must have been that Simon, James's brother, Jesus's brother, also took over after James was executed. I believe Luke, the author of Luke, knows this. It was common knowledge of his day, so he would have had to have reconciled it with the gospel. So by synthesizing sources used by Paul, non-biblical sources like even uh, Flavius Josephus, um, and even incorporating in that common knowledge of the day, I think this author is giving the Gospel of Luke much needed clout. And it would have needed clout in order to make it into circulation um, and to uh, have a wide readership in a world where many Gospels were circulating. So, that kind of historical critical stuff, it soothes my own uneasiness with this uh, mysterious character at this who shows up at this most uh, uh, crucial point of this gospel and only gets one single mention in this whole gospel. Uh, but I'm going to leave it to you to do the work and explore on your own. But here's what we need to focus on today. So what, right? 
So what does any of this mean? What does this have to do with my life? Why are we talking about this story before communion every time? Um, and you know, what is there in this for me to hang my hat on? Well, I think there's actually a buffet of things for us to draw upon here. In verse 21, Cleopas admits defeat of his faith. Our own hope, he says, had been that Jesus would be the one to set Israel free. Some of our friends went to the tomb, but of him they saw nothing. Let's call it like we see it, because Jesus called it like he saw it in that moment. They are unbelievers. Yet Christ appears to the faithful? No, Christ appears to unbelievers first. Those who had had faith, had hope, and had lost it. See, this feels a lot to me like, um, like the story of the prodigal son. And what is the only gospel that the prodigal son shows up in? Luke, right? So let's not write unbelievers off just yet because Christ did not write off unbelievers. My favorite verse in uh, this whole episode is verse 27. It's really cool because Christ, it says, uh, takes the time with these unbelievers to start with Moses and go through all the prophets and explain to them the passages throughout the scriptures that were about himself. Can you imagine how cool that Bible study would have been? But there's also a piece of this that we always draw out, I've mentioned it, and it's communion. These unbelievers, they were walking with Christ, and Christ was going to keep on moving. Christ was going to pass them by, but they bid him to come in and stay with them. And I would have too, after probably hearing that Bible study. But Christ sat down with them, and it was in the breaking of bread together that their eyes were opened. They finally recognized that this unrecognizable person walking on the road with them was the resurrected Christ. They see Christ not on their own, but through this communal act. So faith is the big picture here. It's pickled, I believe, this particular picture in Paul's theology. We've already talked about maybe there's some reconciling going on here. Uh, and it's affirming the faith that Paul professed in 1 Corinthians 15. So, of course, this passage becomes the, the story of God's grace available even to unbelievers. And it takes on the motif of road experiences, like the unbelieving Saul of Tarsus, which is our Paul, on the road to Damascus. And buried in this motif is a confidence that God's righteousness can be disseminated instantly, directly, and it comes from this resurrected Christ. Now, this would have been a slap in the face of Paul's enemies, those who were zealous for righteousness through works of the law. Christ here is never too busy to show up at the table and even at the table of the unrighteous and the unbelieving. And don't miss this amazing subtlety. See, the very moment that Cleopas and his companions uh, recognized Christ, Christ vanished. Isn't that something? As soon as they got it, he was gone. It's as if Luke teaches readers that seeing becomes true seeing when one no longer needs the eyes. Or, as Paul puts it in Romans, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. 
Now, Paul intentionally revises Habakkuk's uh, zealous statement that the righteous ones live by their righteous works, changing it to a new definition. And this is what Paul wants us to get. True righteousness is this spiritual faith in God that comes from God and that is stirred by the resurrected Christ. So Easter people, that's what we are on this third Sunday in Easter. Maybe you are deflated. Maybe you are struggling to believe. Maybe like Cleopas, you don't feel like exploring the scriptures. Maybe you don't feel like stirring up your own faith and pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps anymore. Sure, community would be great, but gathering is impossible uh, for the foreseeable future. Well, this gospel is for you, and this gospel is for me. So let's hear the good news from Luke. Even still, we are those who see without eyes and know God most fully, however we are together. That's what I believe Luke is trying to say here. We are those who see without eyes, and we are those who know God most fully when we are together, however we are together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.